Read the Bible every day so you'll be full of faith. Welcome you to join Bible Race to read the entire Bible in two years. I believe God will bless you, He will lift you up, and your life will never be the same. The Book of 1 Samuel, Chapter 25, The Death of Samuel Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah. David and Abigail then David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran, and there was a man in Ma'an whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had three thousand sheep and a thousand goats. He was sharing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was sharing his sheep. So David sent ten young men. And David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name and thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have sharers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm, and they missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son David. When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited. And Nabal said, Answer David's servants, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed from my sharers and give it to men who come from I don't know where? So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. And David said to his men, Every man strap on his sword. And every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. And about four hundred men went up after David, while two hundred remained with the baggage. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master, and he railed at them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we suffered no harm, and we did not miss anything when we were in the fields as long as we went with them. They were a wall to us both by night and by day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know this, and consider what you should do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his house, and he is such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took two hundred loaves and two skins of wine, and five sheep already prepared, and five seals of parched grain, and a hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cakes of figs, and laid them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And as she rode on the donkey and came down under cover of the mountain, behold, David and his men came down toward her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him and he has returned me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David and more also if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and even Evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause, or for my Lord working salvation himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. For as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, truly by morning there had not been left to Nabal so much as one male. Then David received from her hand what she had brought him. And he said to her, sorry, and he said to her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I have obeyed your voice, and I have granted your petition. 
And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until the morning light. In the morning when the, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And about ten days later the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has avenged the insult I received at the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from doing wrongdoing. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. When the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they said to her, David has sent us to you to take you to him as his wife. And she rose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, Behold, your handmaid is her servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hurried and rose and mounted a donkey, and her five young men atten women attended her. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and both of them became his wives. And Saul had given Michal, his, his daughter David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was of Galim. The Book of 1 Samuel, Chapter 26 David Spares Saul Again Then the Zephites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hachila, which is on the east of Jeshimon? So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Zeph with three thousand chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Zeph. And Saul encamped on the hill of Hachila, which is beside the road on the east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul had come after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies and learned that Saul had indeed come. Then David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where David saw the place where Saul lay with Abner the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. Then David said to Ahimelech the Hittite and to Job's brother Abishai the son of Zeruiah, Who will go down with me into the camp to Saul? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai went to the army by night. And there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment with his spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spirit, and I will not strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, As the Lord lives, and as the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but take now the spirit that is at his hand and head at the, and the jar of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head and they went away. No man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. Then David went over to the other side and stood far off on the top of the hill with a great space between them. And David called the army and to Abner the son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer, Abner? Then Abner answered, Who are you who calls to the king? And David said to Abner, are you not a man who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over your Lord the king? For one of the people came in to destroy the king your Lord. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not kept watch over your Lord, the Lord's anointed. And now see where, this, the, where the king's spirit is in a jar of water that was at his head. Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my Lord, O king. And he said, Why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now therefore let my Lord the king hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now therefore let now my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea like one who, who hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life was precious in your eyes to say. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. And David answered and said, Here is the spirit, O king. Let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. So David went his way and Saul returned to his place. Amen. Following is the English translation of Pastor Martina Huang's teaching on 1 Samuel chapter 25 to 26, translated by Ray. Read the Bible every day so you will be full of faith. 
So now let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 25 and 26 together. In chapter 25, it talks about the conflicts between David and Nabal and also how the wise woman Abigail, how she resolved the resentment between them. In chapter 26, God uh, handed Saul in David's hand for the second time. The first time David let him go, but afterwards Saul keep pursuing David. So God put Saul in David's hand again for a second time, and we'll see how David responds this time. In chapter 25 verse 1, it talk about now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him. So the passing of Samuel definitely brought a lot of sorrow to David, because previously when Saul pursued David, he has also fled to the place of Samuel. But another key is that as Samuel passed away, that also means that David and Saul would never be able to reconcile. So David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. The wilderness of Paran is actually the southmost part in the land of Canaan, even more south than Maon. And so he that means he is getting farther and farther away from Saul's control. And in chapter 25, verse 2 and 3, talks about Nabal. His business was in Carmel. This Carmel is not the Mount Carmel in the north where they fought with the Philistines. This Carmel is actually in the south. And so Nabal's business is in Carmel, but he lives in Maon. So these two places are just like two kilometers uh, away from each other. And Nabal was very rich. And Nabal, this name is probably just a nickname because the meaning of Nabal means foolish and stubborn. So I don't think anyone would name themselves like that. And as for his wife, Abigail, this name means my father's joy. And chapter 25, verse 4 to 8, David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So he, shearing his sheep means that he they are in the time of harvest. That means there will be a lot of uh, fortune coming in. So David sent people to talk to them, peace be to you and peace be to your house and peace be to all that you have. And he mentioned we did them no harm and they missed nothing all the time when they were in Carmel. So basically what he was saying is that David is actually protecting the sheep of Nabal. So in verse 8, David told Nabal saying that please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son David. So here David is very humble. He called himself his son. And here David said we come on the feast day. That means when they are sharing the sheep in the time of harvest it's also the time that they should give thanks to the shepherd. It's a time of rejoice, time of feast. And usually at this time the master will have a huge feast, very generously treat everyone. And here David, he's not being pushy. He's just giving a suggestion. He didn't say it explicitly, saying that, oh, this is something that you should give me because I protect you. But actually at that time, this is actually a custom. So it means that David is supposed to receive a proper thanksgiving uh, in return of the protection that he offered to Nabal. Also, Nabal is like a billionaire. He's a very rich person. And he also lives in the land of Judah. That means he's also in the same tribe. That means that maybe they might even be relatives to each other. Even if it's a very far relatives, at least they're in from the same tribe. And also in verse 9 to 13, even though David, he's kind of famous. He killed Goliath, but obviously Nabal doesn't care about David. And so he's not willing to give anything. And so David is trying to kill him. And here you can see that previously David is always very humble to ask Nabal for help. But Nabal's attitude, he didn't care about David. And then not only did he refuse to give thanks to him, but he even publicly humiliated David, saying that he's the servant who are breaking away from their masters. So David was triggered very angry because it's of course it's not very reasonable he's very politely asking him and this is something that Nabal is supposed to give him and also from this experience you can see that even though David can overcome his emotion in front of Saul in and Gedi but that does not mean that he can overcome again in Carmel in front of Nabal and maybe it's because that at least Saul is the anointed one of the Lord so David can hold on to his emotion 
he can still try to surrender himself under God's power and surrender himself underneath Saul. But here God's arrangement is truly amazing that he arranged a foolish Nabal to stimulate, to trigger him. So now David can no longer control his flesh. He's so angry and he asks everyone to bring their knife and will go fight against Nabal. And so, you know, previously David, he always have this image of being very humble, gentle, um, long suffering, obedient, and have a good self control. But you know, everyone has their flesh everyone has a temper it's just that whether or not you have met that person who knows how to trigger you so here you can see that god will use different kinds of methods to test a leader to expose the old self inside them so that they can learn to really deal with the old self and to come to the Lord and repent again and be transformed. So dear family, today, if you meet the navel in your life, you shouldn't try to escape from it or say that, oh, how come there's this kind of person on earth? Maybe you won't try to kill them, but maybe you spar with them and, or you try not to uh, interact with them forever. And so, but actually this person might be God's specific arrangement to stimulate, to trigger us so that he can expose our hidden anger, hidden pride. So please take out your opportunity. The most important thing is not to circumvent all these difficulties, but to really nail our old self on the cross. And this old self is also the Amalekites that we mentioned in the past. We need, we need to overcome our pride, our anger, our emotion, so that God can finish his works on it. And all these things to prepare us to rule with him together as kings. And so in verse 14, 17, Nabal is such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. So his servant has to mention all these things that happened to Nabal's wife, Abigail. And here we can see that Ab Nabal is someone who really just let out his emotion so that no one dares to speak to him. But here it's great that at least he has a wife who is willing to listen. So may the Lord really help us to be someone who has an ear that can listen. Or maybe your family, your spouses, your brothers and sisters, your spiritual companion is able to speak to you when you really can't listen. So that can help us to become someone who has an ear that can listen, just like Abigail. And next, starting from verse 18, everything that Abigail did or what she said is actually a very good example that we can learn. In verse 18 to 19, now after she heard what Nabal has done, she immediately prepared a lot of gifts and she let the gift to walk in front of her. And when she saw David, David first saw the gift and then saw her. And David was like, oh, how come there are all these something? Oh, everything, so many food on top of the donkey. There are wine and there are sheep. And all these things that she prepared is actually what David need. And in verse 23, when Abigail saw David, she hurried and go down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. So you can see she put the gift in the front and later on when she saw David, she immediately expressed her humility and honor to David with her body language. She bowed down before David and asked for his mercy and then he started to speak. So we really need to learn this. Sometimes, you know, oftentimes, even before we speak, our attitude immediately makes people feel that we are trying to come to find a fight. And so even though they haven't heard anything, they just don't want to speak to you anymore or they just spar with you immediately. So, but Abigail, through her bowing down, through her humility, it invites David to really want to listen to what she wants to say. So our body language is also very important. And from verse 24 to 31, Abigail starts to speak to David. You know, Abigail, even though she's very gentle and she doesn't have a weapon, but she actually controlled the entire situation. Isn't she truly powerful that she didn't just say that, David, you are wrong, but instead she lifted up God's name on high. And she's very sincere and very appropriate and always think for David. So this art of speech is something that we really need to learn. And actually, it's God speaking through, through Abigail to David. So so that David was overcame by her insight so that he didn't make a mistake. So their families, especially for the sisters, Abigail's amazing and full of wisdom's communication skill, she is indeed the representation of making peace. So may the Lord really help us that, you know, oftentimes the way we speak is really influenced by our first family. You know, we no one would like to hear a lot of negative stuff, but you know, sometimes when we grow up in an environment that is full of negativity, then when we're unhappy, we will start to say the same thing. So, you know, previously David 
uh, also for several times it mentioned his language, his words. And here God again used Abigail to let us see how can we resolve the entire conflict with words of wisdom. So indeed, she's very incredible. And in verse 28, she first said, Ah, you know, evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. And next in verse 30 to 31 is the best suggestion ever. And when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation himself. You see, indeed, this word is so full of wisdom that you can see the way that she speaks is to let David, invite David to think by himself. Ah, uh, if you do this, then later on when you became king, indeed, it will cause a great trouble. You know, so here, Abigail is reminding and also saving David's calling as a king. She's reminding David that you are someone with the calling as a king. So don't be so angry just for this tiny thing. It's not worth it to be angry for Nabal. It's so, it's not worth it. You know, look at the big picture. And so David will start to think, huh, yeah, 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 this is me. I'm a king. I'm not a murderer. And so, you know, because David was reminded by her words. And so, but also Abigail's words also elevated, promoted David's scope and identity. Let David realize that he shouldn't stoop at Nabal's level. So here is also learning. We can also learn that when we are trying to make peace between people, we can also remind them who they are. You are so precious. You have such a precious calling. We don't need to be so angry uh, for such a tiny offense, such a tiny unhappy thing, and then become someone who is bitter and unforgiving. Indeed, this is just like what Paul speak to the church in Corinthian, saying that, don't you know who you are? How can you behave just like the worldly people? Don't you know that you are to judge the angels how are you why are you now striving and jealous against one another this is the same rule so that today not only we use this to remind others we also really need to remind ourselves often so that we will not take offense so easily we need to remember that we are the prince and princess of God. So of course, David, he has his weaknesses. But one really great thing about him is that he's very willing to listen to people's correction. And especially here, Abigail is a woman. You know, at that time, woman doesn't really have a status in society. And here, David does not behave like Saul, trying to make excuses, trying to prove that he's right. But here, David is being very honest, even though all his followers is just next to him. And this is also why he is able to transform Transform the people who follow him and change them from a worthless man into the mighty man of David. And so what David said in the first place is, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. So you can see that he's laid it out very explicitly. He doesn't try to cover up what he was trying to do is wrong. And in verse 35, David told Abigail, Go up in peace to your house. See, I I have obeyed your voice and have granted your petition. So when God is training someone who has a character to be a king, one important thing is to have an ear that can hear. So God is not afraid. He's not worried that we are imperfect. You know, God doesn't worry when we make mistakes, but God is looking for someone who are really willing to listen. So in verse 36 to 38, as Nabal humiliated the anointed one of the Lord, basically he's humiliating God. So he doesn't need David to strike his hand, then God himself avenged for David. So the Lord struck Nabal and he died. And so Ab Abigail, she indeed is someone with such a discernment because Nabal, she's very rich. After Nabal passed away, there will be a lot of fortune in her house. Of course, that's pretty awesome. But when David was trying to marry her, she immediately respond. So later on, when David become king, she also become one of the queen. And in chapter 26, after the things in Nengedi, Saul, he temporarily surrendered under God's hand. So it has been quiet down for a while. But now the Ziphites came to Saul again. And so Saul was being triggered again. And then so he came to pursue David. You can see that he's indeed such a faithless person. And in verse 1, he says the Ziphite. So in Hebrew, there is actually an article before the word Ziphite. That means th here, the Ziphites is the same person who betrayed David. David 
in the previous chapters. And in chapter 26, verse 3 to 6, when he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. Abishai came down with David. And here, let's talk about in verse 6, it mentioned Joab's brother Abishai, the son of Zeruiah. So Zeruiah is actually the sisters of David. She has three sons, Abishai, Joab, and Asahel. So these three men are all great warrior, and Joab later on became the chief commander of David's army. And from verse 7 to 12, you can see that again, God handed the life of Saul in David's hand. And here, this is not just repeating the lesson in the past, but it's the second trial from the Lord. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment. And in verse 8, then Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now, please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. Again, the temptation come, and here again, the people next to you tell you that, oh, this is the will of God. God has handed Saul into your hand. And in verse 9, David said it again for the second time, do not destroy him for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless. And David said, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him or his day will come to die or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. And here it specifically says, So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head and they went away. No man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake. For they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. So their families from verse 12, you can really see that it's a godly arrangement to have David have this chance to kill him. But we see how he responds to this opportunity when God put Saul in his hand for the second time in verse 13 to 16. This time David didn't cut the corner of Saul's robe, but instead he condemned Abner's mistake to remind Saul. And here also David is treating this spying as a protection for the anointed for the of the Lord and also let Abner know that how on earth do you guys protect your king that we can enter into the encampment and then come out that you have no idea and so in verse 15 David said to Abner are you not a man who is like you in Israel why then have you not kept watch over your lord the king for one of the people came in to destroy the king your lord this thing that you have done is not good as the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not kept watch over your Lord. So this time he again let Saul know that he has went to his place and he took away the jar of water and also his spear. That means that he's more than enough to kill him. But this time again, he didn't kill him. So in verse 21, Saul temporarily uh, came to his conscience again. He says, oh, I have sinned. Return my son, David, for I will no more do you harm because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have act foolishly and have made a great mistake. In verse 23, David replied, The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I will not put out my hand against the Lord anointed. So you can see David indeed understand how God works, the way, the principle that God works. And he said, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord. And may he deliver me out of all tribulation. So this is the last time when Saul and David m met each other. God is no longer using Saul to pursue David and to build David. And the remaining days of Saul is very short. Very soon he will just die in the battlefield. So we can see that in 1 Samuel chapter 24, even though David, he was not triggered by Saul's mistake and mistreatment, he also didn't try to revenge against uh, Saul. But in verse chapter 25, David was greatly triggered by Nabal. So when he was facing the situation conflict with Nabal, David, he was not alert enough to face the weaknesses inside him. So, but of course, after the entire conflict, he listened to the uh, exhortation from Abigail and that makes him more humble. And so in chapter 26, when he met Saul the second time, he becomes very alert. So this time he didn't even try to cut the corner of his rope. So he don't need to um, condemn himself anymore, but he just took the spear and the jar of water. God res learned to respond using a godly way. That means he's very ready to encounter, to embrace the next victory in his life. So dear families, from chapter 24 to 26, God had tested David for two times to put Saul 
bowl into his hand to see how David would, would respond. So the thing that God will do over and over again, that means this is such an important thing in God's heart. So dear families, so all, remember all the leaders that God has put in your life, either it's your pastor, a small group leader, parents, or teachers, they are all the authorities that God has set. So don't care about how people around you treat them and also don't care about how the people around you speak of them. But may the Lord really guard our heart so that we can really see them as how David sees Saul. We will see that they are the anointed one from the Lord. So today, when we really value, when we really look up to the authorities in our life, God will also value our life and to save us from all tribulation. Do you believe that your future is in God's hand? Do you believe that all the opportunity also comes from God? So do you really believe that God is your only protection and also the only sources that you really need? So in that case, you won't have to be worried that, oh, this person hindered my future. This person didn't recognize my talent. This person, he is mistreating me. This person, he just hates me me. Uh, if I keep staying here, I will not be able to be fulfilled. Their families, do you remember that we mentioned earlier, even David's father forgot David. But God's eye have seen far away the shepherd boy David in Bethlehem. So oftentimes I will try to meditate on 1 Samuel chapter 24 to 26 to keep reminding myself that my life is indeed in God's hand. Everything that I do is in God's hand. Even though in appearance it looks like King Saul is a hindrance for David to be a king. But actually God is using Saul to train up David to have the character, have the life of a king. So when he's ready, indeed, he can quickly remove King Saul from the kingship. So their families, more than just King Saul, even Nabal is what God has prepared. But of course, as long as we have a willing heart, God will also prepare Abigail to help us. So may the Lord today really speak to each one of us. Let us be determined to submit, to surrender to our authority, to really live undercover, honestly. Amen. Dear Bible Race viewers and families in Christ, Thank you for watching our videos. We hope our sharing can enrich your life. If you find the content helpful, we hope you will support our ministry so we may continue to produce high quality videos to serve the kingdom of God and hope to bless more people's lives. You can donate in the following ways. Online giving by PayPal. If you are residing in Taiwan, you may also donate by bank transfer. Thanks again for your viewing and support. Every contribution is our greatest encouragement. We sincerely appreciate your support. May God bless you abundantly. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Dear families, we hope that you enjoy the Bible race as much as we do. If you are willing to volunteer to translate the original Chinese teaching into English or assist with video editing, please email service at 360sunrise.com. Thank you.